Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Chef Nikki Gerardo, host of the Kitchen Scene Investigator podcast. Nikki is an Escoffier Honors graduate who has worked as a creative producer, writer, communication strategist, and on-camera talent for various outlets, including ABC, NBC, and BSMG Worldwide. A cooking enthusiast since age nine, Nikki became known as the Cake Queen after <laughs> launching her first profitable catering business at age 14. Today, she uses her passion for teaching others, comedic performance style, and deep well of culinary knowledge to inspire others through her podcast and culinary endeavors. Join us today as we chat with Chef Nikki about building a successful brand after a devastating injury nearly ended her culinary career. And there she is. Good morning, chef. I'm exhausted from the intro. How are you? That was so <laughs> kind. Hello, chef. I'm so, I'm so thrilled because I feel like I'm back in my Escoffier family. You are. You never left. You never left. We're so, so honored. I, I have to be honest, though. I'm a bit nervous, right? No. I've listened to your podcasts. Wow. W O W exclamation point. You've got an electric style. You have an, uh, an infectious personality. So Thank just you. please don't upstage me today. Right. <laughs> this is, this is my podcast. Okay. So just <laughs> be patient with me. All right. Well, of course. Oh, Jeff, my God. Of course. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, so let's start. Um, I, I'm just really, really excited. Probably go off script a little bit today, but let's start with how you fell in love with cooking, just to set the stage for the rest of our chat. And I, you know, I would say, Nikki, that I, I think that topic sort of connects all of us, right, in a unique way, because that's the theme I seem to see is woven into every story that I hear from, from lots of chefs that we talk to. Something sparked them early in life, grandma, mom, you know, working in the kitchen. Um, and, 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 and usually that sort of moment in life is what dictated whether or not, you know, they went into the culinary uh, world. And so as I understand it, your parents enrolled you in a cake decorating class at a very young age. And was this what sent you on your journey uh, for cooking, baking, all things culinary? Yes. Um, I've been thinking about this so much because um, it's such a wonderful part of my story. And it's the part of my story that I love to revisit because when things get really hard in life, um, I like to revisit my why. Like, why am I doing this? And what is motivating me? And when I was a little kid, I had a lot of energy and my parents were like, oh, wow, what are we gonna do with this child? And I grew up in this little town and we had a little main street and my mom would literally take me walking down main street to burn off some energy. And there's this beautiful little storefront, this uh, cakes and chocolate storefront. And it just captured my attention. And I'm not so sure what it was in that moment, but in that memory, I remember thinking, what is that? I need to know more about that. And my mom must have been so happy. She must have been so thrilled to be able to go back and tell my dad, I think we figured it out with this child. <laughs> so yes, it was classes at nine that my parents enrolled me in because I was just so, I was hyper curious about the world around me. And these classes, what was really interesting is that it, it grounded me and it brought me to a place of expression. And as an adult, I realized that that's what I was looking for. I was looking for a way to express myself. And those classes not only gave me an avenue to express myself, but gave me technique, gave me something, to, oh, excuse me, uh -huh, I have a hair in my mouth. I do this. Get that out. Yeah. Well, well, <laughs> Whoops. You're upstaging me already. <laughs> you're already getting funny. <laughs> no, we'll, really, we'll edit it out. <laughs> so 
Those so, class- so, so let me let me jump in there. I, I love the Main Street story. And I love the fact, if I get this right, your mom's um, walking you to burn off some energy. And, 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 and I'm guilty of this as, as a father of four, that, you know, I don't spend enough time grabbing my children's hand and burning off the energy. Rather, I encourage them to do it. Hey, why yeah. don't you go over there and reset or ground? I love the idea. Something so simple. Let's go for a walk and burn this out. Yeah, I, I love that. So, so you started to. So I start. So it the classes were structured, uh, even though it was a mom and pop shop. The classes were structured via the Wilton um, curriculum. Oh yes, yes, of course. So of course. there was there was an arc to the learning uh, in these classes, and that spoke to my mom's educator mind because she knew that the classes were meeting me where I was, which was ultra beginner. But it was structured in such a way that I could learn something and then go home to practice. Okay, and and okay. I want to make a note of the go home to practice part, because I feel like my mom must have thought, oh, yes, she can practice helping me. Oh, yes. <laughs> we like this idea, Wilton. But in <laughs> retrospect, it met me where I was and it helped me grow as an artist in such a way that, you know, as a kid, you could be discouraged very easily. Sure. Yeah. And what I loved about the Wilton classes is it gave me a trajectory, something to look forward to, something to be hopeful for, something to focus my energy on. And then there was a final, I mean, nowadays we call it showstopper, you know, like the great <laughs> British uh, bake off. But back then it was, you know, the final class. And in that final class, you got to use all of the decorating techniques that you learned. So I, I'm so grateful for that experience because I feel like when you learn something as a kid and it's not structured, it's simply play. And play is wonderful, but structured play sets up the, uh, my child's mind for a journey. You know what I love about that too? And I think about uh, you know young children when they're in school, right? Self-esteem really doesn't come into play. They're they're fearless. You are probably fearless too. And, and you're Maybe a willing, little crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah which, which helps, right? But you're willing to try things um, versus, you know, fast forward to adult learners. You know, you were a student at Escoffier. Sometimes you're a little hesitant to raise your hand, right? Because, oh gosh, let me think about what others might think about what I have to say. So, so, so propel us fast forward you learned these listen these lessons at an early age. How did those memories resonate with you, and then kind of impact who you became well, as a person, but mostly as a yeah, cook? I, I, yeah. I see. I love this question because it's important to connect the dots. Because sometimes in life, it's not a straight line, and what that experience did for me was set a foundation. So I learned to, to make cakes and decorate cakes. And then <clears throat> that was middle school. So by the time I, I was in high school and I, and I was competing and winning blue ribbons and driving my family absolutely crazy. Uh, I mean, we literally were going from competition to competition to competition. And what my parents as, as a team saw was that there was real potential in this for a vocation. A vocation, maybe an avocation, who knows. But what happened was I started selling cakes in high school. I became, <laughs> I still love The cake queen, this. you're an entrepreneur. I became, I became the cake queen. And this was way before Food Network and Cooking Channel and blah, blah, blah where if you came in with a baked good product and you had no competition, you were ace. And so for me, I became the cake queen of my high school. I made everyone's wedding cake. I made everyone's birthday cake. I made everyone's shower cake. And then I diversified, Jeff. 
I went into pies. <laughs> and then I, this was way before seasonal, like cooking in season, right? So I saw that there was an opportunity to make seasonal pastries and seasonal cakes. So I started selling pies. And then I, I, a boy didn't really pay attention to me one Valentine's day. And I was like, you know what? Shame on him. Shame, Shame on, on him. him. <laughs> and I decided I'm going to sell, get this. I'm going to sell chocolate molded roses. And the girls could buy them for themselves or the boys could buy them for the girls. And it was such a win-win. And when I, when I got into the business part of, of my creativity, oh my gosh, it unleashed, it unleashed a capability in me and, and a way to not only be creative, but also be a business person. And I mean, we see this now when, you know, a lot of like culinary talents have a business and a restaurant, they're cooking and they're writing, they're creating products and they're running an empire. Back then I had my little mini empire. I didn't really know that what I was doing was creating a creative business. And oh my God, I just, I loved it so much. And that set the foundation for the rest of, of my early adult life. I, I, I love this story just to jump in. How, how, what was your parents role at that time? So did they let you just, okay, Nikki run with it. Um, or cause I know how I am, right. I, 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 I check their cash register and make sure that they're getting, <laughs> <laughs> I check their food supply. Right. I mean, did, did they keep your books for you or did. So um, what my, we're an immigrant family. So my parents, God bless them. Their, their approach was you go do it. We'll, Love that. we'll be here. Love yeah. But from a technical perspective, like my dad and my mom made sure I had the best KitchenAid stand mixer possible, like the best equipment. Okay. Um, okay. My mom was very uh, attuned to making sure I had the best tips and the best piping bags and a box, like a caboodle box, to organize all of my equipment. I, I give major props to my family for helping me be organized because I, I get so excited about the creative part that the business part, I'm much better at as an adult, but as a kid, the business part was like, oh yeah, I need to do that. I know I need to do that. So God bless them for well, you didn't have rent. You didn't have a mortgage. You didn't have a car payment. Right. So of course you're not thinking about that stuff. You're just, you're having fun with it. Right. But, so but, much fun. but I mean, there's so many cool, um, sort of avenues here. So creativeness, right. Can you tie that into your role as a creative producer, a writer, sure. a strategist sure. and on camera talent? that happened later in life. So kind of connect the dots there. Sure. Um, at, the, at the foundation of all creativity is storytelling. I oh, love that. Yeah. And yeah. when you, whether you are creating a cookie, a cake, bread, an elaborate pulled sugar um, creation, whatever it is that you're making with your hands, you really are creating an experience. And that experience is based on story. Another thing that I think is really important in speaking about story and connecting creativity is that story is price. So if your story is that you're an artisanal uh, culinarian that does seasonal pastries and molded chocolates, then that's the story that can drive your price. And that's the story that can drive the interest of others to buy into your product. So realizing early on, and you know, I've processed this as an adult, but I realized early on that what I was creating was experiences. And those experiences and memories are now stories. And so fast forward to college and you know, early adulthood, it was my ability to tell a good story, beginning, middle, end, funny, sad, hero's journey, you know, wedding, sweet 16. 
whatever that story was emotions informed, yeah, it, yeah exactly it informed everything that i did and so the more i focused on the experience of the person that i was serving whether it was in the culinary part of my life or in television production or in public relations i was always attuned to what is the experience that i want to create for this person or what is the experience I want to create for this client so that they open up their checkbook nice and wide and they write lots of zeros. <laughs> it's the easiest advice to give, <laughs> comma, zero, 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 right? Comma, zero, it's zero, the zero, easiest zero. advice to give to anyone who wants to serve others. Number one, create an experience. And number two, like your customers. Yes. Like your customers. Yes. Speaking, of, speaking of which, so be, what, I, I read something about a foodie theater business. Was right, that right? So I think, let me just connect all the dots. We're going to go over the bridge. We're going to connect the dots and then we're going to land in Escoffier because I, I, I just loved my Escoffier <laughs> experience. So in my early career, I did television production. Then I did public relations and then I really missed food. And, um, when I realized that as, as you get older, you really need a North star to guide you in life because things are gonna get hard. They're gonna get really hard. And if you live from, from your North star and for your North star, and what I mean by North star is what is your guiding principle in life? Like, what are you all about? Like when you get up in the morning, what are you living for? And my North star, has been democratization of food information. Because when I was a kid, I would read like Gourmet Magazine and Ruth Reichel, and food for me was travel. Food for me was an escape to learn about the world. And back then there weren't as many um, outlets. So I, I, I developed this passion for food as travel, food as information, food as expression and food as learning yourself. And so being, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I, I love that. Is there a television show or a podcast in the making there? The, the, <laughs> I, right? I, and the North Star piece is so, I mean, it, it keeps you in your lane, <clears throat> right? My 11 year old son when I introduce him to chef, friends, partners, restaurant tours, whatever it is, one of his first opening lines is always, so what's your mission statement, chef? Exactly. And, and, and you know what's amazing, Nikki, is that the chefs always have a mission statement. They've uh, always got something to come back with, right? Absolutely. I mean, you need a menu, right? Your menu kind of is your, is your mission, is your arc. But I want to go back to your question. You asked me, um, there was a theater for kids. And in terms of the theater for kids, that was the culmination of all the things I wanted to do. I wanted to use my North Star of being of service to others to empower others to develop what I call your life menu, how you experience your life and food. And the purpose of going back to Escoffier, moving forward to Escoffier, was to get the technical and the creative um, uh, skills to bring this kids theater, culinary, kids culinary theater concept to life. And essentially, it was a vehicle for kids to practice their international language skills um, through food. And it wasn't just a summer camp idea built into this concept was real life um, education uh, built in standards for testing. So while the kids were having a lot of fun, and by the way, the pricing that I did on it was much more competitive than sending your kid to um, a camp and then they you know, sit on the sofa for the rest of the, the, rest sure, of the day. Yeah, yeah, the pricing yeah. was really, really competitive. And so my business partner is my sister and she is uh, getting her PhD in education and built into the program was an ability to test the kids on the same skill set levels that they were learning in, in school. So sure, they were having a lot of fun, but at the same time, 
they were practicing the skills that they need to get into college. So it was a win-win. The parents got rid of their kids for the week or whatever. Um, they got to have a lot of fun. And we were doing Spanish, Chinese, and Italian. And those were the three languages. Uh, those were the uh, three predominant languages that were being studied in the market that I was going to launch in before I got hurt. <laughs> well, let, and, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Um, uh, in, in a moment, but I, I, I do have to, from an academic perspective, I have to make the comment that what more beautiful approach to assessment than the students, the kids, not knowing they're being assessed? Like, when's the last time you were surveyed by Amazon? Let me help you. You right. weren't because right. they already know, right? So imagine a world where you don't know you're being assessed because you're having so much fun. I, I, I love that concept. Thank you. So, so now roll us into, I'd, I'd love to hear what your experience with the Scoffier was like. What, what, you know, got you up in the morning? What, what, what was the highlight of learning? Because we all know that when you're learning, you're the best teacher you can possibly be. Were you even a better teacher while you were going to school? So I actually never got to roll out the program, believe it or not. Oh, wow. I'm um, stealing it. I'm totally stealing it. <laughs> you <laughs> What's your sister's name? Anna <laughs> oh my Here? God. She would love it. She would be Here like, we go. <laughs> she, she, she would say, those are five zeros at the end of that. Nice. Um, I never got to roll it out. And that winded up being a blessing in disguise. But we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment because I really want to talk about Escoffier because it was a pivotal moment in embracing my 360 self. I decided to go to Escafé, number one, because it was a techniques-driven program. And number two, it had the business component. So there was a creative side and the business side. And that was gigantic for me. I didn't want to learn the five mother sauces and not be empowered to launch a business. I mean, at the end of the day, bottom line, full stop, it had both things that I wanted and it was online. Um, and as I got into the program, you asked me, what was my favorite thing? I mean, I wish I could just whittle it down to one thing, but what stays with me the most are the instructors, the chef instructors. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I forget which class Chef Janet taught, but she really encouraged me to write. And which was like a blessing and a curse in this, you know, at the same time, because I'm so verbose, like I go on and on and on and on and on. And she's like, no, Nikki, you really are a talented writer. And I, I, I would think, well, are you saying that because I'm a terrible cook? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, is it so bad? <laughs> you know, is it terrible? And she just really encouraged me to write in the narrative part of, of, of the class, right? So when you go to Escoffier, you have the narrative, you have lab, and then you have your photographs, and then all that leads into this final, you know, submission. And in the introduction, in, introduction, hello, <laughs> in the introduction of those that coursework, I would delve so deeply into the narrative because it it set me up to telling the story of what I learned in the class. And I guess I must have been like an anomaly because I would write like two pages of a narrative. And she, I just loved how she encouraged me. It, I wrote stories about pickles. I wrote stories about, <laughs> you know, uh, moose. I wrote stories about um, demi-glass. And, and that was so encouraging for me. And when you're working and going to culinary school at the same time, encouragement is so important. And Janet's and the perfect. Uh, I, I know love Jan, her. I know, I know her I well. Her. She lives here in Colorado with me. And, it, it, you know, I don't ever want to underestimate the importance of what you're talking about. This, this idea of expressing yourself through words, the narrative is really about critical thinking. That's the way our chefs understand that you understand what you're doing. And 
You said it earlier, uh, Nikki, you mentioned that it's about telling stories and chefs are great at telling stories. So Absolutely. we want to know the story of, of, of the technique that you engaged in. So I, I imagine the pickle story was phenomenal, <laughs> right? Uh, because not everyone, not everyone has that gift, right? Not everyone has right. that gift. So no, I, I absolutely love that story. I'll, I'll tell Janet hello, by the way, too. I She's... just, I, I was recently featured in Wine Enthusiast Magazine. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. It came out in November. Uh, I'll send you a link to it. I'd um, love to see it, right? It, actually, if you go in my Instagram, in my tap in my link in bio, it's in there. Give, give, give our viewers and our listeners so, your Instagram real quick. This is your- So it's kitchen- scene investigator there you go there so you go saucy. it's so saucy and that <laughs> that article is um is in wine enthusiast magazine it was in november and the title is how to pair wine with caribbean food according to the pros and i'll tell you the the flavor passport that we learn in school yeah was yeah. the absolute critical tool that helped me organize my thinking for the wine tasting uh, for that article. And so knowing that, that I learned these skills in school and I, I used them for this article, and I did a live tasting at one of the most incredible Puerto Rican restaurants here in LA called Roomba Kitchen. And as soon as it came out, I could not wait to tell Chef Janet. I, I just, <laughs> it, it just meant a lot to me. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that, that, that's, that's beautiful and tons of congratulations, but while Thank we're you. on the accolades, um, I believe there's potentially a James Beard looming, Ooh! right? Okay. Are we hoping? Are, are we praying? Uh, we're, okay. Um, I'm so excited to talk about this because I've been, I've been <laughs> working on myself and the potential of this as a professional for like the last five months. So in, no in November or December, I submitted my podcast, Kitchen Scene Investigator, um, for a James Beard Award in the podcasting category. Bravo, and bravo. Um, I know, <laughs> I know. Um, uh, I had to, so rewind real quick. When I designed my show, I just wanted to talk to people. Yeah, yeah, I just sure, wanted to talk sure. to people. And that's and why it's good. That's why it's positive because that's all you're doing, just talking all, to people. Yeah. And it's phenomenal, by the way. It's thank you. So good. Yeah. Thank you. And so when I designed like the arc of the show, all I wanted to do was tell a great story. But most importantly, I wanted to leave listeners with the ways and language of the pros so that they could they could explore with more confidence and develop their own life menu. Going back to that North Star, um, empowering others to create and express themselves fully. And what that meant for the podcast was it didn't have a definitive 30 minute or 60 minute or 90 minute um, bookmark, you know, or arc or setup. Um, so when I submitted to the James Beard Awards, it only, it, I could only give them 60 minutes. Okay. So uh, the show that I submitted was with Chef Andra Shirey, who is the executive pastry chef at Kraft here in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. And she's my friend. So I, we sat in her living room and we talked uh, soft peaks, middle peaks, hard peaks, uh, mousse. We talked citrus. We talked chocolate. She basically revealed the inside secrets to the skills that it takes to be a great baker so that listeners at home could take those skills and you know be the best chocolate cake maker that they want or whatever it is but she gave she gave listeners the inside scoop people and, and that, love people love easy listening like yes. that right it's not complicated yes. right you, there'll be no exam at the end of this chat right <laughs> And so I submitted in November, December, and the nominations come out on um, April 27th. I had to edit that show down to 60 minutes from about an hour and 20 minutes. 
So I learned a hard lesson on podcasting and storytelling and setting up the podcast with audio intros and outros and transitions so that if I need to just put a 20 minute podcast out, I can do 20 minutes, even though I recorded two hours. It was a very hard lesson to learn, Jeff. A very hard lesson. Sure, sure, sure. So we'll see. We'll yeah, see. yeah, yeah. We're praying for you. We're hoping. Thank you. Fingers crossed for sure. You know, let's let's segue to you at, in, at, at the risk of being, you know, a little emotional. Um, and I'll go first. Right. Okay. You know, um, and not even necessarily in the context of working in the industry, just in the context of life. Right. Sometimes we're we're dealt a rough hand. Right. And, you know, no one's no one's going to call our bluff. Right. So sometimes life is hard. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at a place in my life where I'm sort of an evangelist for, for, you know, getting over the hump. Um, you know, 40 years ago, I had a, a kidney transplant from my father and I, and, and, and I, and my wait, father wait, say that again, you had a kidney transplant from your dad. Yeah. Yeah. My father's still alive, 85 years old. And, and, and you know what the most Jeff, beautiful, that's part, amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. We, medicine's amazing. Right. Um, hope and, and love is amazing. Um, you know, the, the beautiful part of this story is, is my mother, right? So my mother was the one, you know, when I'm a 19 year old kid who says, you know, nothing in your life is going to change. Your North star remains your North star. This was, you know, a momentary lapse. Um, we've addressed it and we're moving forward and, and I've never looked back. Right. And, you know, and I share that primarily be, because I'd love to, to set up your vulnerability a little bit here. If you're open to talking about, sure. I think you were w- with, within, within view of graduation and, and you I had was, a pretty significant injury, right? I was three months, three months, finishing. one from quarter finishing. away from the, from the finishing tape. From the finish line. And, so tell and, us what happened. I was working at a very upscale, uh, bougie restaurant. I was closing the restaurant. And as I entered the kitchen, you know, when you're a server, you're running, you're walking as quickly as possible. You, you need to close that restaurant down before, um, you know, the 2 a.m. Uh, deadline. And you need to, there's just so many things on the checklist, right? So I'm moving quickly. And as I was entering the kitchen, um, a box had been pushed against the runner carpet and there was a buckle in the carpet and my left foot got caught in the carpet and I went flying in the air. And so um, I, I did a split in the air like Simone Biles, but I'm not trained. Yeah. And I landed, I landed on the corner of a, um, of a, metal table right in the middle of my chest right by my heart and uh thank god that that's where i landed and i didn't land you know on my face or on my eyes or on my hands um and uh i herniated four discs uh all going in opposite directions and i couldn't walk so sorry Um, Take your time. Thanks so much for sharing it. It's, um, it's, it's what I, it's necessary to talk about this because at the end of the day, you know, you can choose, you can choose to have adversity take you down. Um, but, or choose not exactly, exactly. That's what I was trying to say. So I landed on a corner of a, a metal table right in the center of my chest and, um, uh, damaged my rib cage, uh, herniated my back. But even though I could barely walk, I sent a message to all of the chef professors and, um, oh my God, uh, the chef Dean at the time, his name slips, slips my mind. Oh, I'm embarrassed. Um, anyway, I went to the Dean of the program. I said, listen, this is what happened. I can barely walk. And he, he, his base, his response was, you know what? You've been cooking for us for almost a year. We know you can cook. We know you can write. So 
whatever you're doing in, at this point, it was farm to table and uh, flavors of the world, Your right? Last class, yeah. My last class. He said, I want you to do everything written. And that was probably Chef Graham, right? Yes. Yeah, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm so embarrassed. I'm sorry, Chef Graham. Oh. I couldn't remember. <laughs> so, Chef Graham said, I want you to do everything written. And the bookmarks of that were that I had Chef Janet on savory, right? With, mm -hmm. For flavors of, of the world and farm to table. And I had Chef, I forget her name, for pastry. Um, uh, short, dark hair. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm showing my age. Anyway, the point is this, they were so supportive in doing that hard 180 pivot from actual lab, actual cooking to writing. And they had seen my writing before, mm -hmm, but they didn't, mm -hmm. it, it's not like when others were sauteing, you know, onions and doing chicken, uh, you know, uh, chicken liver mousse, or just, you know, you know, uh, researching Europe or Africa or, or South America and doing the tasting menus. Cause in that class you do the tasting menus, even though I wasn't sauteing and cooking. Oh my goodness. Now I had to describe the science. So I really didn't, <laughs> I really didn't get a free pass. Critical uh, thinking comes back into play, right? The narrative it really is did. important. Yeah, it really did. Yeah. And the you Chef, the universe is a funny place because I had to do this and Chef Janet, you know, credit to her. She said, you know, you need to find photography that um, displays what you're thinking and what you're writing so that I can see that what you would be doing in the pan is what you're saying on the page. And that <laughs> level of research at the end of the day, I don't care where you are in the culinary world, being a good researcher, a discerning and thinking researcher is your best friend. And uh, in Flavors of the World, I research Peru, uh, Sweden, and Sri Lanka. Oh, I love it. I love it. And so imagine trying to find photographs of a tasting menu you've never made on the internet from Sri Lanka. <laughs> And, and the support though, the support is, so first of all, thank you for sharing the story, um, You're welcome. which, which, which is, well, I'm happy that we're here together and, 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 and I'm yeah. happy that you, you're right. The uniform, the universe provides in a strange, but beautiful yeah. way. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, you'll run into more chef Janet's and more chef Graham's, you know, uh, along your way. So, you know, I, I, I think it's important to be able to share the stories that make you who you are. And, and, and speaking of which, what, what's next for, for Nikki? I mean, so, this, this, this is exhausting, right? I, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot. What's next? So, um, I took the kitchen scene investigator kids class and created the podcast kitchen scene investigator. And so universe being a funny thing, uh, what started out as a concept for a small community is now worldwide. And it, the, the podcast really serves as a brand platform, a branded platform. And it's, it's, um, it's an invitation and a declaration at the same time. And what I'm looking to do is use Kitchen Scene Investigator as my personal brand as I offer creative services to uh, the food and wine industry. And when I say creative services, I mean content creation, everything from video to audio to written content. And I get to use my creative side and my PR and my TV side to bring the technical skills that brands need for content creation. This is not just lofty content creation. So I have the podcast, I'm freelancing and creating content for big brands. You're writing, have, you're writing, huh? you continue to write. Right? I continue to write a lot. That's the, that's the core of my freelancing is I write. So whether it is uh, copy, website, um, uh, product description, PR materials, speeches, anything in the public domain for the food and wine industry, that's what I create. Um, I have the James Beard potentially uh, coming up 
but I, I really feel that because I'm now in a global audience that my future is really bright and and I love creating content. I love writing. I love doing the podcast. And please be my guest. Please oh my gosh. Oh my, my gosh. I can't believe it. She asked, me. she asked me. I I was gonna be super humble about it. I'd love it. Yeah. Wait, no, I I'll sit in your chair, you sit in mine. Yeah. yeah I would I, I would really, it. I would really love that because I think that the concept of going back to culinary school as an adult and going back to culinary school online is a subject all on itself. And I would love to talk about the program and what your experience is like. And I think it would be really interesting. I think there are a lot of closet culinarians out there who are living a quiet life of desperation who would love to, to re-examine and re-enter the culinary world. I love, I love and respect line cooks. I love and respect chefs. But what a great culinary education does for you is open up an incredible world of opportunity um, in the culinary world that goes beyond cooking on a line. And I think that's that's a conversation that you and I can have. I love it. Keyword education. Keyword yeah. is education. And the name of this podcast is The Ultimate Dish. And we've come to that point where in your mind, Nikki, what is the ultimate dish? And you can go anywhere with this. You can okay. go to Peru or, or you can go to your home kitchen. So do I have to give only savory or sweet? You don't have to do anything. You can okay. tell me anything okay. you want. Okay. 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 I love that you follow the rules though. <laughs> I'm trying real hard. <laughs> I'm trying really hard. Um, my ultimate dish is flan. Wow. Wow. Okay. All right. Tell and me why. Here's, here's why. Flan can be a sweet or savory expression because it's custard. Mm -hmm. And what I learned working in the restaurant business for 15 plus years is that custard is really hard, but can be gorgeous. Oh, yes. Gorgeous when oh, yes. done right. And so believing in having your own life menu, I say, get good at 20 things, call it a day and just go on, go on. And so flan is the, at the top of my life menu. And I love to do it as a sweet expression and as a savory expression. It is the one, if anybody knows me and knows me well, and invites me to a party, they don't even need to ask me what I'm going to bring. They know, they you know, flan. They, I'm bringing flan. What, and what, it. what accompanies the flan in terms of, are you bringing a, 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 a tawny port? Or are you bringing? Ooh, ooh, See? ooh, <laughs> chef. Um, I, oh, oh, you got me. <laughs> I would bring like a Chateau de Kem. Of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> the most expensive dessert wine that exists. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. I in would the, bring a chef in the little care. bottle, right? In yeah. the little bottle. Um, I would bring that or like a late harvest Riesling or, or an ice wine, something in I that. I thought you might way. go the German route, but uh, the Chateau ah. de Chem is, is, let's just stop there. A little, <laughs> a little flan with Chateau de Chem that, that works for me. That's perfect. Thank That's you. That's perfect. But that, that flan with Chateau de Chem or a late harvest Riesling is my perfect dish. Ultimate, ultimate dish. dish. Perfect. Ultimate dish. Perfect. And this has been an ultimate chat. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I got to, uh, to, to visit with you today. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, chef. This has Thank been my pleasure. Oh, I was really looking forward to it and um, you were really kind. So thank you. <laughs> you made this, it easy. You're this good. This is just storytelling. Am I? Did You're I do good. okay? Did I do you okay? Did great. Oh, you did I love great. it. I love it. Bravissimo. All Bravissimo. right. My, hey, my people will reach out and we'll get something scheduled. Okay. Okay. I would <laughs> love that. All right. Thank you, Nikki. And thank and you, Chef. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast. 
where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.